Hi there. My name is Rick Miller, and I'm a psychotherapist in Truro, Cape Cod. Welcome. I am doing this program to give back to all of you, healthcare providers, first responders, in the era of COVID. My hope is that I can give something back to you, whether you feel stressed or traumatized by all that you've experienced. And I've worked in this field for 35 years. I've been through difficult times myself. And I wanted to lead a support group and made some phone calls and it was hard to figure out where to do this. So the next best thing, or maybe the best thing, was to record this webinar for you so that you can listen to this whenever you would like. What I'm going to do is give you some information about managing stress, about dealing with traumatic moments, the best ways to take care of yourself. I'm also going to give you some mindfulness exercises. And what I have is a recording on self-care for yourself, but also I have a recording for sleep. So there are two options for you there. And I've also interviewed five healthcare providers on Cape Cod, five or six, to also share their goodies with you about how to best take care of yourself. So I just want to say I'm incredibly grateful for the work that you do here on the Cape. We are here, we are well taken care of. I'm sure people say thank you a lot, but all of us healthcare providers who are participating in this program are so grateful. And as a healthcare provider, I know what it's like to go home at the end of the day. It feels nice, I feel proud, it feels good to give back, but sometimes we go home by ourselves and we need a little bit more recognition. So that's a piece of what I am doing for all of you and I really appreciate it. I'm gonna talk about the nuances of being a first responder, what it's like, what to expect, even though I may not need to tell you. And um, just got some information to share with all of you. So thanks for doing this. You can listen to this whenever you feel the need. That's why it's recorded. And first, I would like to interview Julian Sear. So here, my name is Rick Miller, and I'm a psychotherapist on Cape Cod, putting together some kind of information and webinar for first-time providers and healthcare providers on the Cape dealing with this pandemic. So I was hoping you could welcome people and offer us words of wisdom. Sure, good to be with you, uh, Rick. I don't know what words of uh, wisdom I have, except that um, this is a time where we're relying on people in the helping professions, including uh, mental health counselors and psychiatrists and psychotherapists, uh, social workers, um, you've been called to this work uh, already for probably a whole host of really, um, you know, good good reasons. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I think folks folks need help now more than ever. And as I think, you know, um, what we've been in for the last seven or eight nine weeks um, really is going to be something that's going to continue for quite some time. Right. And uh, that's just going to be really tough for a lot of people. It's probably it's tough for you as uh, providers. And I think. Yeah. First and foremost, you got to make sure you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, wh while you're taking care of others, um, I'll speak personally. I certainly rely on um, my mental health uh, provider, uh, who's a licensed social worker. Uh, certainly been relying on on him uh, in these trying weeks, uh, and I also just try to you know take advantage of uh, this beautiful place we live in. Um, we're lucky here yes. uh, on the Cape and the Islands that you know. If you can just get out the door, um, you can be someplace pretty special uh, and, and rejuvenating. Uh, so I'm trying to do that as well. Uh, but we're really mindful of, of how uh, challenging this is for people. We are expecting that there's going to be a surge uh, in mental health needs. Yeah. Uh, and so what all of you are doing now um, is, is it already makes a big difference, but I think it's needed um, now more than ever. And I'd like to comment on a couple of things that you're talking about. First of all, we live on Cape Cod and it's such a place of beauty. I agree with you there. And I hope people can take care of themselves by creating time and taking the time to go outdoors and take advantage of this beautiful place that we live. I also think from a mental health point of view, we don't even know what has begun to hit us. Yeah. That, you know, we're dealing with what we're dealing with so far today is May 1st. Um, some people feel the impact of doing this intense work already, 
but I think some people are not going to feel it for a month away, two months later, three months later. Stress and trauma just act that way sometimes. Um, and I also suspect that some people are not going to be forthcoming in talking about what they're really experiencing with their loved ones. So that's why I'm here. Well, yeah. we, won't, we won't keep you for long. I just wanted to have you welcome people and to express your gratitude for, for our doing this. So No, thank you so much. And, and these issues, you know, I want people to know these issues are not only critically important to me, but to the legislature, uh, to Senate President Karen Spilka, who's made mental health, uh, transformation of mental health, her number one personal priority. Actually, before all this happened, we passed uh, the Mental Health ABC Act in the Senate in February. Uh, I'm still hopeful we can get that done because it'll mean a lot of really good things for uh, mental health access and, and for right. providers. Um, but just really, really, really encourage people to take good care of themselves. And if you're running into any issues sort of personally as it relates to state government with whether it's questions about um, policies or licensing or you have a, a client who needs help with unemployment or any other issues, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to my office. Uh, we're, we're, we're in the helping profession too, uh, and we're glad to do what we can. Well, thank you for all the amazing work that you do, Julian, and thank you for doing this as well. Take good care. My pleasure. See Take care, Rick. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Yes. So we have an incredible lineup of speakers. Uh, as I said, these are all mental health professionals that work on Cape Cod. And I'm sure happy to share with you what it is that they have to say about dealing with COVID-19, some of the struggles, some of the ways that it's a challenge, great ways of taking care of yourself. So here's who we have on the lineup. Uh, we have Dickie Hansen from Outer Cape Health Services. We have Leo Blanford also from Outer Cape Health Services. Both of them are mental health clinicians. We have Barbara Dominic, who's a consultant uh, social worker with the Nauset Schools. We have Dan Gates, who's the CEO of the Age Support Group of Cape Cod. We have Justine Pottergill, who's the Assistant Director at Bay Cove Human Services, and also Diane Kovanda, who's a yoga and mindfulness instructor and a holistic health practitioner. And what I am hoping to do with this series for you is to give you a multitude of perspectives with self-care. And the truth is, uh, you know how to take care of yourself. So I'm not asking you to do anything that you haven't already done, but getting the perspective of these healthcare professionals means that you're getting feedback from people who live on Cape Cod, many of whom are dealing with the same issues that you are in the era of COVID-19 and also have the expertise of being a psychotherapist or working in the human services and sharing information. So should be exciting to hear from each one of these people. Now, what's interesting in terms of thinking about COVID-19 is that there are the direct aspects of COVID-19 and the indirect aspects. The direct aspects of COVID-19 are the realities of dealing and working in a time that is so friggin scary. I'm assuming that many of you have been working with ill patients and have unfortunately dealt with patients and family members in crisis, dealing with illness and death and huge proportions of that. That's direct. Um, you're representing the community in profound ways and hopefully you're getting the gratitude and the thanks that you deserve. Sometimes it's hard to take that in. Some people struggle with that. Um, but the other weird thing about COVID-19 is that the population that you're working with is not separate so that you go home at the end of the day and shut your door and stop worrying. You know, you're working in a time where people are ill and dying and there's a lot of uncertainty around you and simultaneously you have your own issues going on with your family at the same time. Um, so, you know, how much time you spend reading the newspaper, watching social media and absorbing all of that in the midst of this intense work is what makes it even more challenging. Many people have elderly parents and they're worried about their parents. Some people have not been able to see their parents because they live in homes that don't allow 
outside contact for safety purposes. Then there's your kids. How many of your kids you're dealing with who may be scared themselves or may not fully understand what this is about. It's so complicated. So uh, there's a lot here. There's a lot going on. Um, again, we're all dealing with it. Um, I think bottom line is that you've chosen a profession for yourself that's really meaningful. And you do it because you love it. But were you trained or emotionally prepared for working in a time that's this intense? Probably not. So a lot to share with you in a short period of time, and it's great to have you here. Thanks. So welcome, Barbara Dominic. I'm thrilled you're here. And you and I have been in contact about doing something for healthcare providers and first responders on Cape Cod. And so I kind of blame this on you, but <laughs> it's also thrilling to have you. And uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks, Rick. Thank you for doing it. It's, it's yeah. nice to meet you. And uh, it, it's so um, heartwarming to see someone like you step up and offer your services right now. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think great minds think alike. So do you have any thoughts about first responders and healthcare providers on Cape Cod? It's early May. What have you seen so far? And what do you imagine will be the case over time? Well, I, I, um, I sort of landed in this position of being an information gatherer and who knows what else um, by way of uh, contact from Senator Sears' office. Yes. Um, and so it, it really caused me to start doing some inquiries. I mean, I'm very connected to human services in the Cape because of my work as a social worker. So I started checking in with people that I know and mm -hmm. uh, some first responders. And I think what there have been a few people involved in the conversation, as you know, and I think what I've been able to determine is there are pockets of pockets of people, mostly town-based, who either have a system in place, some sort of a system, or they're talking about having a system in place. For example, Provincetown has an entire COVID-19 task force, and they yeah. have a warm line, and yeah. uh, what well, is interested in doing the same thing, and then... Um, um, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know yet about local police and fire, et cetera, on the mid and upper Cape. You know, that's part of, I'm working my way down. Yeah. But my sense is in general, Rick, that there are sort of pockets of things happening, but not, I haven't been able to find a coordinated, broad effort to create a support network for first responders. And when I, when I say first responders, and we've had this discussion at the county level, we really are talking about first responders and frontline service workers, yeah. meaning human service workers, because yes. I, I think we need to bring into the fold the shelter workers, um, totally. the nurses, nursing assistants at nursing homes, yeah. um, you name it, all, all the people who they must work because they have to take care of people and help save lives. Yeah. So, so that's a big tent. Mm -hmm. um, Cape Cod Healthcare, which is the huge healthcare organization here on the Cape, they have they have an in-house program set up to support their healthcare first responders, and it's best I can tell it's a combination of virtual meetings and connecting to therapists. And then there are some local workers. Um, for example, I think many of the EMTs who work for towns, mm -hmm. they have access to the same healthcare coverage that yep. the other employees do in employee assistance programs, but not everybody wants to use an EAP sure. and not everybody feels comfortable reaching out to a mental health professional. That's right. At the, right. At the risk of stereotyping, um, you know, first responders are very strong people and they're, they're used to shouldering a lot. And I think because of that, it, it's hard sometimes to not only know when to reach out for help, but to take that next step. So, and I actually, I think, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. No, just, just in conclusion to your first question, I think the conversation is expanding. And I think the outreach and the request um, at the state level has really helped spur that along. I think it was already happening, but I see the conversation growing. So I'm, I'm hopeful because I think we're going to need something in place long after this is gone or after we return to some level of normalcy, whatever yeah. that is. Yes. 
Uh, I just wanted to comment when you were talking about some of the first responders that may be a little proud and uh, not wanting to reach out, but my guess is that some of them are going to be watching us having this conversation because some people will have gotten to a place where their emotional needs or psychological needs are getting to them um, because of the intensity of this work. So for those of you that are listening to this conversation, hooray for you. <laughs> Share this recording with other people. Um, Absolutely. And you and I, Barbara, I think we spoke a week, two weeks ago for the first time and Julie and Sear connected us and I'm a therapist and I wanted to give back in a certain way. And I thought, well, maybe I can lead a group for healthcare providers somewhere. And when you and I, first spoke a couple weeks ago, you know, what you told me was that it was still soon in the game and that people were so busy taking care of patients and um, needs of COVID that no one is, had gotten to the point of thinking about themselves yet. So what I, through speaking with you, what I decided I could do as a way of giving back is this very thing, uh, interviewing a few people sharing some of my expertise um, to help care for people. And this may be the first step that people have in taking care of themselves. So any way that this recording is helpful, I'm thrilled. Um, Me too, Rick. Me too. Yeah. I forgot to ask you, you wear a few different hats on the Cape. Where are the places that you work? I do wear a few different hats. I'm, if I could just make one more comment about our first responders, then I'll go to that. Okay. They're wonderful here. There's so much, there's so much a part of the community. Mm -hmm. And this is a small town. The whole Cape is a small town. Pretty much everyone knows everyone else. Yeah. And um, they, they provide the most excellent care and they're wonderful people. I, we wouldn't be able to do it without them. So. Absolutely. And uh, I so, say- so For those thank watching, you. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very important. <laughs> So the so, many yes, hats. I do. So my, my many hats, I've worn many over the, I'm a social worker, mm -hmm. um, like you, I'm an LICSW, and I've worked in lots of settings. Currently, I am a retired school adjustment counselor from a local school district, and now I'm working as a consultant in human services at the, at the county level, and some for the school district. So um, it's, both roles are kind of carve out roles, and that's really enabled me to have a lot of latitude in exploring yeah. first responders' support yeah. and needs. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that you and I spoke a little bit about and I've been thinking a lot about is the timing of everything, that sometimes with the intensity of a crisis, we roll up our sleeves and we do what needs to be done, and the impact of that doesn't hit us until later on. And so the excitement of doing a recorded webinar is that anyone can listen to this at any point in time. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we can offer something like that. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about over time, what people may notice or experience, first responders, healthcare providers, anyone on the front lines. Well, I, what I've already heard is um, from, not some, a noticeable uptick in domestic violence calls. Yeah. So yeah. You know, people notice that they're, you know, they're more irritable, they're, they're fighting with their spouses, their partners, not getting along with their kids, not getting along with their coworkers, yeah. um, not sleeping, you know, ruminating, having a lot of thoughts that they can't get rid of at yeah. night about what they've seen during the day. And another, another huge one that has been pointed out to me several times is just the worry that am I the next one right. who's going to get sick? Right. You know how how long before I get the virus? Yes. So, and it, you know, as you know, it's cumulative, and for some people, it just it seems like it pops up, but often there are some warning signs, and um, it's important to kind of check in with yourself and yeah. see, you know, do you, are you not feeling like yourself? Mm. Are you do you not recognize this person that you've become? Yeah. Um, are, are people saying to you, they're worried about you? Those are some of the things I think to watch out for. Yeah. And I am hoping that there will be more services available for people. Um, support groups are incredible ways of being supported. 
incredible ways of appreciating that, oh my God, I'm not the only person thinking this way or feeling this way. So over time, I suspect there'll be more and more services that are available to people on the Cape. You know, I really hope so, Rick. And I think it's not for lack of interest, for sure. Yes. You yeah. know, we often, we tend to do things by neighborhood or by town here. And I think if there was ever a time to be more coordinated about that, this is the time. Yeah. Because we all, we all need each other. Yeah. Um, so I, I hope that going forward, there'll be some things that really become part of the fabric of the support. Absolutely. Here on the Cape. Yeah. Yeah. Any tips for self-care, what people can do to take good care of themselves? Um, basic, some basic things. Um, as I mentioned before, monitor yourself. Mm -hmm. Check in with yourself from time to time. How, how am I feeling? Am I, you know, am I getting enough rest? Am I having trouble falling asleep at night? Um, so check in with yourself as much as you can. Get outside. Yeah. You know, get outside, especially on those rare sunny days that we've been having. Oh, Get outside, go for a walk, whatever, whatever it is that you do. If you work out, you know, work, work out. Mm. Um, try to eat well. Mm. You know, it's, I, think, I think in that kind of frenetic pace that first responders operate in, understandably because they have to, it's yeah. easy to kind of not pay attention to making sure that you eat healthfully. Yeah. Um, but that, that's important. That really helps us feel stronger and healthier. Um, and talking to people, you know, keeping, staying in touch with your families, uh, staying in touch with friends, um, having, having a support system among your colleagues that you, even if it's not a formalized support system, that you can just run things by or debrief about a situation that you've been involved in. Yeah. Um, I think that's, you know, it doesn't always have to be, oh my God, I got to call a therapist because the, the truth is. Right. For some folks, they're, they're just not comfortable doing that. And I get that. You yeah. know, I, I, I've had that feedback from first responders. Sure. Sometimes people are just more comfortable talking to people who speak their language. Yeah. So if you have people who speak your language that you're comfortable talking to, use them. Yeah, um, absolutely. Care for each other. You are a wise woman. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we love our first responders. Exactly. And I, I was thinking when you were talking about the adrenaline of being a first responder and, and being the people that are on the front lines of this epidemic, there is an excitement to it and there is an excitement to being part of it. The problem is that sometimes it's hard to crank that down and that part of self-care does involve relaxation, taking a few deep breaths and doing whatever we can do to stabilize ourselves. And as I said to you, I will conclude this series later with some kind of a relaxation exercise for people uh, for, for, re for that very thing, so. I, I love that, I yeah. love that. I think we, we can't overdo how important deep breathing and, and learning how to really do it right yeah. Yeah. is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Any other final comments or suggestions for people? Um, I, I just I just want to reemphasize something I said before, Rick. I really hope that as a community we can come up with a system of support, whether it's a combination of things, peer support, professional support, and really keep it keep it in place. Yes. Long after things have have stabilized, because you know we're we're paying more attention, starting to pay more attention now to support for first responders. Yeah. But they're a category of folks who always need that support because they're doing yeah. some of the hardest work there is to be done. Yeah. So um, I hope that people will take time to pat themselves on the back for doing yeah. that because not everyone can do it. Yeah. And um, and take good care of themselves and know that they're appreciated yeah. beyond words. Yeah. Well, I think that you've helped plant the seeds for future services that hopefully will be available on the Cape for for a long time because uh, taking care of ourselves is critical. So it is. I, that's my goal. Yeah, wonderful. And I have a feeling I'll be in touch with you after this. <laughs> I hope so, Rick. It's been very nice talking to you. You too. Thanks so much for doing this. Take care. So just wanting, I'm wanting to share some more information with you. Uh, one of the things that comes to my mind is 
work has become a very dangerous place in the era of COVID-19. Obviously, the world has become a dangerous place and we're all worried about being infected. But those of you who are working in the front lines and are near people who are ill, of course, are putting yourselves at risk. That's a huge big deal. It's a big deal because of you. It's a big deal because of worrying about your family members. And yet, I would guess that for many of you, it feels like this is what you have to do and there's no choice. That your career is so profound and so important to you that you're, you're exactly where you need to be right now, um, for better or for worse. And that's amazing. And the whole issue of receiving thanks, of taking it in, of being okay, being in the spotlight, that's kind of where you are right now. I think about the healthcare workers in New York City at 7 p.m. who are greeted with thank yous from people in the city, um, from their balconies and fire escapes and all that. And of course, living here is a little different because people are not that close together. So I'm hoping that you're getting the thanks that you deserve from our community. Um, everything is heightened at this point in time. There's so much uncertainty. Um, are you working a normal schedule? Are you working overtime? Do you know what normal even feels like at this point in time? Uh, I keep talking about the direct and indirect aspects of COVID. And of course, your career is keeping you busy doing a lot over the course of your day. But you're also probably living a surreal existence with your family in terms of if you have kids, they're home from school, they're climbing the walls, they may be scared, they may not understand. Um, again, the issue of older parents, if you're seeing your parents, if you've lost your parents, if you're not able to see your parents, nothing is the same. And as I speak to my own clients and as I speak to my own colleagues, what's universal is people feel depressed, people feel uncertain, people feel burdened, and it's a feeling that just doesn't even go away. Uh, then there's the issue of your own infection, either the risk of being infected, or perhaps there may be some of you that have been infected that have needed to step away from work or needed to tell other people, which of course is a big deal, or you haven't wanted to tell other people. So everything about life is 10 times as hard as it's always been. Um, we've not gotten any training for a time like this. Other pandemics have been years and years and years ago, and so We've been living life with an illusion of safety, with an illusion of health, and suddenly, in a very short period of time, we ended up living during a time of not being ready. Uh, and so here we are, kind of in the midst of it, and we didn't have the fortitude internally to be prepared. Instead, we just kind of jumped into it. So that's an odd surreal existence as well. Uh, the other thing I was curious about is who's protecting you in this? So you're in the front line protecting us, but are people above you supporting you? Are your workplaces supporting you? Are they even prepared or set up to give you the support that you need? Or do you just show up and we're in it together and you do it? Is government supporting you? You know, my guess is that the government has not expected anything like this. And so you may not be getting the cushion that you deserve without even recognizing that that's the case. Hang in there. Uh, the work needs to be done and you've chosen to do this for us. Again, I can't thank you enough and the community can't thank you enough and you may not feel like you have a choice and at the same time it's your calling. Um, Keep doing what you're doing. Recognize that the stress of this is absolutely certain. It's so surreal. I keep talking to my colleagues about what a bizarre time we're living in. It just feels like unreal and we've gotten accustomed to what it is. And I keep saying later on, 
we're going to look back at this period of time and think, how did I get through this? How did I weather this? And like many traumas, we do what we need to do to get through it. And sometimes the impact of this hits us later on. So there's a lot to process in all of this. Just uh, notice where you are. Okay. Welcome, Dickie Hansen. It's thrilling to have you here to talk about the needs of healthcare providers and first time responders dealing with COVID. Maybe you can start out by telling us who you are and we'll go from sure. there. Thank you. It's nice to be here, Eric. Um, I'm Dickie Hansen. I'm the uh, Director of Behavioral Health for Outer Cape Health Services. Um, we have, we are trying to integrate mental health into primary care, which is an uh, important piece. And um, we are doing, I think, a great job here uh, on the Outer Cape. Yeah. So let's talk about COVID. Today is May 1st. Um, what have you seen? Where do you think we're going? And more importantly, the people on the front lines, uh, healthcare providers, frontline people, uh, I just wanted to address how people can take care of themselves and how we can offer support during these trying times and also in the future without even knowing what's going to happen next. Well, I think what you just, this last sentence you said, not, not knowing yeah. where this is going, it is probably one of the hardest things for all of us. Yeah. And uh, of course, especially for healthcare providers uh, and first responders who are out there on the front line. First of all, I just want to say to all who are out on the front line, a deep thank you. Mm. And uh, my admiration for the courage uh, and dedication that you all have. But um, I think, the uncertainty creates anxiety for, I think, most of us. When we can't control something, um, and this thing we are trying to control, but we don't really know how exactly, and we are trying our best, but this creates anxiety. And I think um, in addition to the hard work that everybody is doing, they have to live with this uncertainty how long this is going to go on, how much it's spreading, all of that. And so how do we cope with that? I guess it's the yeah. really hard part. And, um, you know, the best thing is for us, I think, to create some kind of space in our mind that has some um, tranquility or some peacefulness. Uh, I think kind of the worst thing we can do is completely immerse ourselves into the COVID mm -hmm. because then it takes over. Yeah. And so if we can create some space in our mind of, um, of good things, um, how can we do that? I think it's really important to uh, come to recognize um, or, or come into the present moment. Um, let's say you've been out there working all day really, really hard, and you have seen a lot of really sad things and hard things. You come home, and it's really easy to keep on thinking about that yeah. and yeah. worrying about all of that. And so the important piece then is to say, okay, I'm home now. And I look around and I can think, I am so glad I have a home to come to. Mm -hmm. I am so glad for my wife, for my husband, for the people who love me. Uh, I'm glad that I can lay down on the couch and do nothing. Um, being able to sort of come up with some of the simple things 
And the minute we do that, we create a little bit more space in our mind. Yeah. Being out in nature, I think also we're lucky here on Outer Cape to be able to see the ocean, see the bay, see the woods. Um, and to really to take, time to take the time to do that. I mean, Julian Sear was just speaking to me and he was saying the same thing. And, you know, sometimes we're so busy, we get caught up in our lives and it doesn't, doesn't matter where we live. And yet you're right. We live in the most beautiful place. Sometimes I think it's the most beautiful place on earth. And I yeah. think we owe it to ourselves to take advantage of it. That's the way to feel best. Yeah, that is so too. So you and I spoke on the phone the other day and you said something important to me, which I want to echo, which is that not everyone is going to go to therapy in order to help themselves. And of course, we're both psychotherapists and that would be what we would wish for and what we would want. But my hope is that even in watching you and I talk to each other, that people will receive some kind of inspiration to take care of themselves if they're not willing to go to therapy. So I don't know if you wanted to, to talk about that at all. Well, you know, um, there, are, there are many therapists out in the world. <laughs> <laughs> not and, there are. Uh, our neighbors sometimes can be our therapists. Um, and of course, our hairstylist, although we can't do that right now. Right, right. <laughs> um, but being able to, to talk a little bit to somebody, um, okay. that maybe is one of the best things we can do. Because yeah. when we hold it all inside, um, it can kind of spin out of control. Yeah, takes on a life of its own. Yeah, and of course, um, it isn't, and you know this, you know, it isn't like we are miracle workers, right. but right. we can listen and we can kind of walk alongside people through some of these difficult times. Yeah, I also think that some may be fearful of going to therapy because they're going to have to rehash their upbringing and their mother and their family. And at least for this, um, I'm thinking that therapy would be helpful for people who are experiencing symptoms of extreme stress. And it can be very short term, time limited, and hopefully you can find a therapist and we can help you find a therapist that specifically will focus on uncertainty, anxiety, and trauma, and let that be the focus. And again, short term. Short term, that is so true. And it's, it's finding just uh, cope, ways to cope with this, um, yeah. and that has, not very much to do with long, long-term therapy. It's, yeah. This is more short-term, trying to figure it out, problem-solving. Where, where do you suggest people would go if they're interested in therapy as a result of watching this or recognizing that they're having sleep problems or maybe drinking a bit too much or having anger outbursts? Where, where should people go? Well, I think it's important to... Um, one can contact Outer Cape Health uh, mm -hmm. if, um, if you are a patient there. Uh, I think contacting your primary care doctor can be very helpful. They can steer you in the directions you are going. Um, there is something um, called Psychology Today, That's which right. is an, uh, online, and you just type in Psychology Today, and you type in your town, mm -hmm. and then a list of therapists shows up. Yeah, based um, on location. Yeah. Yep. So uh, that's another way to, um, to find a therapist. That's a good point. Probably best way. What, what symptoms would you say people should look out for um, I was saying to Julian, it's possible that people are fine now, but a month from now or several weeks from now, they may be able to notice that things are off. What, what would you say to look for? Well, <clears throat> I think that when you find yourself um, maybe dreaming, having nightmares mm -hmm. about um, what your work um, I think that is one thing. Um, when you find yourself 
being uh, unable to relax, that you are kind of just really geared up and you know that really you don't have a reason to be this geared up, that is something's not quite right. Yeah. Um, I think, um, again, finding out that you're really short um, with the people you really love, um, you get maybe more angry than you want to be. Um, you mentioned this too, drinking a little too much. Um, and you're kind of recognizing that you aren't really who you used to be. Um, and I think that, I think sometimes because you have been through really traumatic situations, uh, one can even get kind of flashbacks from, yes. from when you were in the middle of things. Yeah. And uh, it kind of haunts you. That's a and good point. Those, That's those a... are things that can show up. And when you notice that, it's really smart to then try to get help. Yeah. Um, some people, when they close their eyes at nighttime, they review some of the images of the day or the sounds of the day, or weeks later when they felt like they were able to push it aside and it was gone, they find that it, it comes back. And I just want to say to people that are watching this, that is okay. That is not unusual. Um, I'm certainly not hoping that that happens, and I know it won't happen for everyone, but it's not a sign of weakness to experience this. That's true. That's a good, really good point in trying to figure out what's normal. Yeah, right. And what can have spiraled a little bit out of control. Yeah. And uh, because some of these things are normal too, the yeah. feelings that you're having. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you. What do you do to take care of yourself that works? It's a good question. You know, it's easy for us to give advice and then not do it yourself. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but for me, it's being outside. For me, it's being physically active. Um, our work is very sedentary. We sit a lot. And so um, being able to go out, work in the yard, um, and go for walks. Um, I personally love to go to the ocean and look at the vastness of the ocean and kind of almost do a little ritual of sending all my anxieties and struggles and all of that. I just sort of take it mm -hmm. <laughs> to the ocean because the ocean can hold all of that. Yeah. And so th those are little ways. Great. Thank you. I was speaking to a colleague who lives in Mexico City of all places. And she was saying, the thing that I miss more than anything else is being by the ocean. And I thought to myself, how lucky we are. We have it here and it surrounds us. So yeah. I urge people to take advantage of that, like, like Vicki says. Yeah. Any last minute comments for people or suggestions? Um, again, a heartfelt thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, Dickie, for doing this. Thank you, everyone, yep, for doing just, this. It just broke up for a moment. So if you don't mind saying that again. Sure. A heartfelt thank you for all to all of you who are doing this important, important work. Um, and then also to say, when you feel really, really shaky inside, it's not a weakness to ask for some help. That's right. Thank you, Dickie from Outer Cape Health. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and I'm hoping that people will hear what you have to say and allow them to get any help that they need. And um, you've been a big source of support and comfort. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rick. Take care. Good to see Bye. you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Bye. So we're talking about these times of COVID, how odd it is, and you're all working hard, and the stories that you have seen, the stories that you've witnessed, the care that you've given, the intensity of these times, 
the pain, the illness, the deaths. It's just really intense. So the whole purpose of this is to take care of yourself. Um, but I think we also need to make sense of this to appreciate it. So let me just say a few things about self-care. One is that for many of you, you've had trauma in your life prior to COVID-19, unfortunately. And the reality is that when you have a new trauma superimposed on something existing, it sometimes causes things to flare up once again and even more intensely. So I'm sorry if this is happening for people, but it is in the realm of possibility. Um, but I want to remind you of something that we all know, but we need to be reminded of regardless, which is that life goes on. It's spring on Cape Cod. It's beautiful outside. The trees are opening up. The flowers are coming up. And all signs show us that life continues along. And some of you may be watching this right now, and some of you may not even watch it till the fall or the winter time when the weather is going to be different and life is going to be continuing along. Regardless of COVID, our life goes on. And the truth is, is that horrible things have taken place in the world before this. Maybe I wasn't alive for some of them. Maybe you weren't around for some of them. Sometimes it's been our parents or our grandparents They've lived through World War I, World War II, different plagues. There's the Holocaust, there's HIV, there's 9-11. Now, I'm not saying this to depress you at all. I'm saying this to remind you that when people are going through a really traumatic time at the moment, it feels like life can't get any worse. And it also feels like there's no way that we're going to be able to kind of manage through it. When in reality, something happens, people get through it. I love speaking to older people that have weathered some of these storms that reassuringly say, it's going to be okay. You may not know it. We're going to move along. So think about it. Our elders are our role models. Channel them. Bring them with you. Somehow they learned about resiliency. They learned about coping in ways that some people our age and younger than me haven't learned yet. And this may be the experience and the teacher, but at this moment in time, we don't even know that. So uh, not to be redundant, but please keep in mind that there have been tragedies, traumas, horrific times in history, and somehow as human beings, we muster up resiliency and we keep going. So. This is huge. Um, I think it's also important just to recognize what it is that may be going on inside of you that's worthy of paying attention to. The first symptoms I want to talk about are anxiety. Anxiety, we all know what anxiety is. Ruminating thoughts, obsessing about what's going to happen, sometimes intense kind of heart palpitations and heart beating. Other symptoms of anxiety might be elevated body temperature, uh, intense speech, going too quickly. And anxiety, of course, is a common reaction to times like this, to stress, to trauma, to difficult moments. The ideal way to take care of anxiety, of course, is to slow yourself down. So just be pay attention to yourself and notice whether you may have some symptoms of anxiety. The other common reaction to difficult moments, of course, is depression. Now, how do you not be depressed in a time like this? It's kind of hard not to be. I personally have moments where I'm totally fine and I'm like, everything is good. And then an hour later or a day later, I feel horrible and I can't, I can't get out of my own way. And so it's not clinical depression, but it is depressing to be living through a time like this. And as I said earlier, when you're watching television and you're listening to social media, watching social media, how do you not get overwhelmed? Some of the typical symptoms of depression are flat, blunted affect, having a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, uh, feeling no joy in life, no energy, being weepy, tearful, 
Some people in your life lives may notice that you're not yourself. So those are some typical symptoms of depression. If you're experiencing either anxiety or depression, please consider talking to someone. Please consider getting help for yourself. It could be that the trauma of this time is like lodged inside your body, or it may be that something bigger is going on, which of course I hope is not the case. Another common coping reaction is to drink too much or to use drugs or to use too many drugs. Um, please pay attention to that. It can be a little bit risky and you wanna make sure that, you know, if, if you are drinking or using drugs, that you are using them mindfully. Uh, I have an interview with Dan Gates, who's gonna be addressing this. Um, I also wanted to say that there's a difference between healthy numbing versus unhealthy numbing. Now, that's a fine line in terms of defining that. There are things that we do in our lives that take us away from pain. That's good. But if the things that we're doing to take ourselves away from pain are creating more difficulties and more stresses, that's not good. And that's something to absolutely pay attention to. Um, being traumatized during moments like this is completely normal. So what's challenging is what is post-traumatic stress disorder versus what's normal trauma? I wish I had a clear-cut answer for you. Um, I guess what I can say about this is that living through COVID-19, dealing with quarantine, dealing with fears of infection ourselves, dealing with cabin fever, dealing with family members, dealing with watching people who have been ill or helping people die is pretty traumatic. I don't know if you need to worry about having PTSD from this, but I do think it's worth spending time and attention on yourself, making sure that you take care of yourself, being aware of the symptoms that I may be describing or symptoms that you may be noticing inside of yourself. Some other symptoms might be physical manifestations of stress, Sometimes people have stomach issues. That's a common one. Another thing that's common are skin-related disorders, asthma. So notice whether your body feels like it's in sync or whether something is off and whether stress may be a factor in that. As I said, being traumatized is normal. I also wanted to speak about the difference between males and females. I think we all kind of know it. But females generally are more process-oriented, are able to talk about what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, what's going on. Females are apt to reach out for help, to need to talk about what's going on with people that they're close with. Um, men are more prone to keeping things in. We're raised to be strong, to be stoic. We're not supposed to be vulnerable. So what happens during times of stress and trauma is that sometimes we carry the weight of the world on our shoulders and don't really let anyone in. And sometimes we drink too much. Sometimes anger is the outlet. And obviously that's not good and that's not healthy. So keep a watch on whatever your own symptoms are. Just a reminder, stress existed long before COVID-19. So we had our own issues going on in our lives before this. COVID-19 is just imposed on the stress that was already there. So unfortunately, life is twice as hard for many of you at this moment in time. There's issues pertaining to relationships, to work, to money. Those are the common things that's uh, uh, equated with stress. And then, as I mentioned earlier, family issues, uh, kids caring for elderly parents, and of course, not being able to see elderly parents who are in certain homes also is very, very stressful. And money. Money's a big one. We live on Cape Cod. A lot of people have to work extra hard to make ends meet. And so COVID-19 is just adding stress upon stress. So that's uh, the grim reality about life. 
and I will talk about managing stress a little bit later on. I just wanted to be sure that you are honest with yourself, that you take your own self inventory about what you're experiencing, and also listen to other people who are close with you. Everyone, my name is Rick Miller, and today we have Leo Blanford with us. Welcome, Leo. Thank you. So maybe you can tell us about your different roles on Cape Cod and what it is that you do here. Sure. So as Rick said, my name is Leo Blanford. I am the director of community-based services at Outer Cape Health. And essentially what that means is the health center has a program where we do outreach services. So essentially the catchment area for Outer Cape is the outermost 10 towns, which yeah. is Dennis, Yarmouth through Provincetown. And what our program is able to do is respond to any resident within our catchment area, regardless of insurance, regardless of whether you are a patient at Outer Cape Health, to help um, access services. So that could mean um, accessing behavioral health services. It could mean accessing uh, substance treatment services, uh, primary care services. Uh, so it's it's it is a um, it's an open gambit. So essentially, if you if there is any resident that is in need of services, Outer Cape can help to um, provide a resource. So they don't have to be an Outer Cape patient in order to benefit from the resources. Correct. And I'm asking you this because this particular program is for first time responders and healthcare providers dealing with COVID on Cape Cod, and so. One of the things that we're beginning to see, and I think it's only going to increase, is that um, people that have been first-time responders and providers are going to recognize that they have a need for their own care, that they haven't necessarily had time to even right. think about. So it's nice to hear that your program can be a service to them. Yes, absolutely. And so not only can, so it is a service to them, and it is a service to essentially anyone that is in need of it. So, you yes. know, I think that with the focus being on first responders, yes. um, I, I think oftentimes that is a, um, it is a hard, um, sometimes it can be hard to even know where to turn to, to yes. connect the services. Yeah. So this would be a program that could help facilitate that if, if needed. And uh, if you are able to talk a little bit about first time responders and if you're seeing anything right now, it's early May um, and what you anticipate may happen over the next several weeks, not necessarily regarding COVID per se, but regarding the needs of first time responders. Sure. And, and, you know, I would say that COVID does play a pretty significant role in, in um, how people, how we are, how we as humans are responding. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that if we are to think about first responders specifically, um, you know, they are seeing a lot of how this is impacting our community yeah. on a daily basis. And so whether that is phone calls or whether that is personal interactions, what, what, what do they do with that information over, yeah. over an extended period of time? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think for first responders to um, feel a, sense of change, whether that is, you know, a change in sleep, a change in eating habits, yes. um, maybe some increased uh, irritability. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of this is just looking at um, changes that are occurring from day to day. It could be um, maybe a different perspective on going to work where yes. there is just a, a lack of, of energy or a lack of uh, um, um, a, a sense of of uh, resentment about about going in. So I think that, you know, for everybody, it's going to be a little bit different. And so how to take some of these different indicators um, to uh, as a as a as a notion of things to pay attention to. Yes. Um, yeah. Because sometimes these things can happen incrementally over a period of time where yeah. maybe sleep patterns are changing a little bit or um, eating habits are changing a little bit and to really pay attention to if particularly in, in your social network, um, whether it is a partner or children or friends, maybe noticing that um, you are a little bit more angry than normal or having a little bit more 
um, shorter temper than yeah. the average, that those would be some some flags that might be saying, you know, something is going on. And thank and you. Yeah. Talking. I think what I'm aware of as you're describing this is that sometimes in the midst of an emergency, and in this instance, the emergency is a pandemic, we do what we need to do. The adrenaline is flying. We have no time to question how we feel, how we're doing, how we're functioning. We just kind of get through the day and kind of give to whatever it is that's going on. And frequently when the dust settles is when people experience some of the symptoms that you're describing. And I'm also assuming that what you're describing is equally as applicable to healthcare providers as well. So absolutely you want to say absolutely. something about that. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, some some things to consider if if one is having that experience, obviously is maybe some some professional support. Yeah. Um, but also reaching out to, to a, a partner, a, a workmate, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, to have some way of, of uh, identifying um, the difficulty that all of us are, are experiencing under the circumstances. And frequently so, uh, other people that can notice that's right. that we're acting different. Um, that's right. So I, I'm glad you're bringing that up. And what does that look like? So in those moments where maybe there is some time at home, during the the when it, we have an opportunity to be a little bit more quiet, um, what does that look like? So, do we have a, a, a is there a sense of anxiety or a sense of 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 um, uh, urgency that comes up? Is there more self medication that happens, whether that is drinking or even prescribed medications? Yeah. Um, so, you know, are there are there changes in in daily activities that are unusual or that are um, different than, and, and when, I guess when I say different, it's sometimes it is hard to really know what that is unless we are getting feedback from, from someone that is saying, hey, you know, something is going on, something's yeah. not right, you know, I just want to check in with you to make sure you're okay, yeah. uh, to, to really pay attention to those things as, as you know, they could be um, early signs of, or maybe late signs that, that something is going on. I also wanted to address the issue of gender, that females are more apt to ask for help. Yes. And men are more apt to hold it in, feeling like they can handle it themselves or that nothing is wrong when in fact the issues of substance use, substance abuse, or even anger or violence can increase as a result of holding things in. Absolutely. So I really wanna put in a plug about making sure that we are all taking our own inventory to see how we're doing. And like you're saying, check in with people that we're closest to, to get their opinion and really listen to them. Yes. You know, I think with, with uh, you know, as the, profession, the mental health, behavioral health profession grows, you know, and, and um, starts to expand on research, you know, I think that it's surprising how little is known about resilience. Mm. So, you know, we all have capacity for that to some degree. Um, and, you know, I, I think oftentimes that is what carries, carries us forward through, uh, through a lot of this. And so, um, you know, to acknowledge that that oftentimes can, can happen over a period of time. Sometimes we go through these uh, bumps in the road that, yeah. that, that come up, um, but particularly in the healthcare field, in the first responders field, you know, there is this sense of, you know, I'm the one who's supposed to be responding to right. the emergency. And so I don't, I, don't, I don't need this help. I can do it, I can do this on my own. Um, and, and you know, there uh, is nothing wrong with, with needing some support every now and then, it's 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 actually quite normal. And I would say that not only is it normal, it's I would say to a lot a big degree, it is to be expected that yeah. uh, we all will have some uh, peaks and valleys through through particularly through these times. And um, you know, to to reach out to a, a friend or to a professional to say something doesn't feel right. You know, yeah. let's is this something that we can explore? Is is um, I, actually, I would say, um, a, a a sign of strength more than a sign of weakness. Sure. Uh, so, just to encourage that, you know, the 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 feeling of you know isolating, 
um, you know, is would be quite common if uh, one is to experience stress and burnout. So to to kind of insulate and to uh, be away, you know, is not necessarily a a, a peak sign, but I, I think just to be aware that sometimes we do need our our, our own space uh, to to um, you know work through some things. But if we are doing that on a consistent basis and combining it with with self-medicating or combining it with excessive whatever it is that that, that might be a, a warning sign to, to say hey maybe we need to change things um, in a little bit more of a beneficial way when I think about covid what I'm aware of and I've spoken about this is the fact that first-time responders healthcare providers are dealing with this issue that also can impact themselves and their families yes and typically other work related issues it's more kind of us versus me um, so this hits a lot closer to home and it makes it more challenging you also mentioned the issue of resilience and i think that some people can fool themselves into thinking they're resilient when in fact they're still having a reaction to what they've experienced and even though uh, COVID hasn't been as bad in Cape Cod as other places, it's been pretty incredible to think about the sacrifices that we've had to make, to think about the number of people that have been ill, to think about the nursing home. So my guess is a lot of people that are watching this, again, firsthand, saw the impact and are still experiencing the impact. And as a human being, we don't, walk away from that without any kind of reaction whatsoever. So resiliency is a good thing, but it's also not a sign of weakness that we need help. And it Absolutely. seems like you and I are coming from similar sides yes. with this. Yes, yes. Have you seen at this point, early May, any healthcare providers getting help or asking for help or first time responders? I think it, it's starting to trickle in a, a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so I think a part of, you know, what you are doing, I think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that there, there are efforts to have some, um, some capacity to make available opportunities then to interact. And so, you know, I think that the, there are, are, so, maybe an easier way to say is yes, <laughs> but you know, I don't, it's not, it's not like it is, uh, you know, the faucet is not fully open. So I, I yeah. think things are starting to trickle a little bit. And so, you know, I, I think that right now there is still so much uncertainty. So we, I mean, yeah. I think that nobody really knows what the next two weeks or the next four weeks or the next two months are going to look That's like. Right. And so yeah. I think that what comes along with that is, you know, some sense of lack of control and, and you know, to some degree, um, you know, just not knowing and what that presents. Yeah. And so, um, you know, who knows what what uh, is to come. And so with that, you know, symptoms that may not be happening now may come later on down the road. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I, I, I think at this point, nobody really knows if is this going to be a few more weeks, a few more months or, or longer. Right. And so, you know, I, I think that to have some awareness around um, indicators. So maybe right now things might be OK, but later on down the road, uh, as we continue, uh, that could change. Uh, so I think it's always good. It's good for all of us to, to have in mind what some of those things are so that we can, um, you know, perform to our fullest potential. And I think that's what, you know, particularly uh, healthcare providers and first responders are doing on a day to day yeah. basis is, you know, yeah. how do we perform at our fullest potential because lives depend on it. And so, um, but that's also a lot. That's a lot of stress. That is a lot of, it that's is a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. So, how, yeah. do we, how do we pay attention to that and move forward in a way that is supportive of that? And one of the reasons why I'm doing this is simply to give people permission to get help for themselves. Yes. And I'm also personally hoping that a lot of workplaces will be motivated to offer support um, to their uh, staff members as a result of seeing this. So here's to that. You're an incredible resource at Outer Cape Health. We, you know, we as a community are grateful to have you here. Any last minute comments before we, we end this interview? I would just say that, you know, we are all in this together. So, you know, I think that this is something that is impacting us all. 
Um, and if we can support each other the best that we can, particularly our, our healthcare providers and our first responders, uh, we need you. And you know, we need you to, to endure this uh, with us. And so the best way to do that is to, um, to seek support when it's needed. And Wonderful. so hopefully that, that can happen. Thank you so much, Leo Blanford from Thank you. Health. Great to, yes. great Thank to you. chat with you. Take care. Thank you. Welcome, Justine Pedorgal. It's great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. So as you know, I'm interviewing healthcare providers on Cape Cod to speak about COVID-19. And just to be aware of any issues that people may want to hear about or not want to hear about in terms of what to look for, self-care, uh, friends, family. So I don't know if you have anything in particular, if you'd like me to ask questions. Um, well, I would just love to say that, especially during this extremely stressful time, um, it's just really important to be aware for your own mental health of how you are dealing with this additional stress. Um, so making sure that you're aware maybe if your sleeping patterns have changed or maybe your appetite, you've noticed a difference. Just really be aware of that and then knowing how to then better take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so setting a healthy bedtime, making sure you're eating healthy meals still, um, and just making sure that you are getting out into some sunlight, into some fresh air when it's available and the temperature <laughs> allows us. <laughs> That's a very good point because we've had a lot of cold, rainy days, and I've noticed that people wow. feel so much worse during those days. Now, you and I happen to be meeting on a really sunny, beautiful moment, and uh, yeah. That's a relief. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so wanted... definitely taking advantage of that when we do have it. Yeah, for sure. Um, you raised a couple points that I wanted to comment on, which is that people that I'm speaking to are saying that they feel so exhausted these days that mm -hmm. the, the stress of what we're living with that's so weird um, for many people not going into the office, for some people kind of holding the weight of the world on their shoulders, Mm -hmm. means that they're so incredibly tired. Um, so it's not unusual that people feel that and, and kind of feel an extra burden. And also, I'm sp speaking with a lot of people who are saying that they're sleeping too much. Um, mm -hmm. Some people say that they wake up in the middle of the night and they're not able to fall back asleep, but a lot of people are also saying that they just cannot get out of bed in the morning. So. Yeah, and I think just with some people not having that structure of going to work, their normal right. routine, they're definitely noticing that. So doing your best to you know, set regimented times of sleep, um, times to be awake, and just trying to fill your days so that you are more active and that you're feeling more like yourself in your normal routine. It's just so important. Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing that, that you touched on was appetite. And of course, mm -hmm. what I thought about was, how most of us are cooking more and eating way more and drinking more just because there's not as much to do. So we sit at home and, and we do these things. And at the beginning of the pandemic, it felt a little scary to think about, oh my God, if I do this for weeks, what's gonna happen? But simultaneously, it felt more short, short term. But at this point, it isn't, so. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's great of people who are like trying new recipes, trying to do more in the kitchen, but just really being aware, like you said, of their portions, you know, what types of recipes that you're making, because it can be really difficult to say, well, when is the end? So then I can get yeah. back to my normal yes. pattern. Um, so it's just important to really try to modify that here and now when you can. I think that we're very fortunate. We get a lot of fresh seafood here, so that makes yeah. it special to cook. <laughs> Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about were if you had any ideas about friends and family of first responders and healthcare providers in terms of relying on some of these people for feedback about how people are doing. I definitely feel that even though, you know, we are isolated, it is so important to reach out to family, friends, loved ones, you know, being in the mental health field here, we, uh, my staff here of clinicians, we love to talk, but we also love to listen. So it's just making sure that we're 
keeping those relationships, building those relationships, even if it is in a different way yeah. and reaching out to people that you feel that maybe you haven't heard from in a while because they could be struggling with this in a way that maybe you didn't anticipate. Yeah. Just so important. Yeah. And I forgot to ask you form formally at the beginning of the interview yeah. <laughs> where you work and okay. what your department <laughs> provides for services. So thank you for alluding to that. No worries. Um, so I am the assistant director at Bay Cove's mobile crisis team here on Cape Cod. Um, so we are a team of clinicians that work in the community and in the emergency rooms um, doing psychiatric evaluations. So we are a mental health crisis team that can provide additional support into the community right now, getting people referrals from maybe therapists or additional support as needed. So. Mm -hmm. We are available 24 hours a day for anybody who needs assistance. It's a wonderful resource. And yeah. are healthcare providers and first responders eligible for the services that your agency provides? So to a degree, we are always wanting to help everyone. We are contracted by certain insurance companies. Yeah. But if anybody calls, we can direct them to how they can get better access to uh, mental health care also. Okay, so even great. if maybe one of my clinicians can't go out due to an insurance issue, yeah. um, we can definitely direct you to where and who can. And what are the major insurance companies that, that your agency accepts? So we're contracted with all mass, mass health products. Yeah. Um, certain commercial insurances within the community, but with all children under the age of 19, we contract with all insurances. So if any families notice their child is struggling, we can absolutely assist. Okay, so I think we're getting to another important topic, which is that sometimes people feel as though they're doing okay, mm -hmm. but it's very important if you're a parent to notice signs of stress in your children. And I wonder if you can address that for a moment. Absolutely, and especially with our children. I mean, they've been out of school now. They've completely lost their structure and their more personal relationships and ties. And that can manifest in different ways. You know, some children can show irritability, some can withdraw, some can be more overbearing and attached to their family. So just noticing any differencing and yeah. ask. Ask your kids, you know. Yeah. I'm noticing a change, you know, what's going on and can we talk about it? It's such a scary time to be a kid, depending on one's age and not fully understand what this means. Um, so there's the issue of day-to-day -day life and losing the structure as they know it. But there's also this threat out there that we as adults can understand, but kids may not really be able to fully grasp it. And mm -hmm. that in my experience, what we're doing with social distancing is that we've developed a phobia of people. And how do you explain something like that to a child who's used to being so social? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. And I think that some children may be able to have that conversation and some you, we just have to explain it as, you know, right now we're staying home, we're staying with just our family so we can all stay safe. Mm -hmm. So using very um, easy words for them to understand and giving them a very clear understanding we're just seeing family. Yeah. 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 I also am imagining that children of first responders are absorbing the stress in their household, even if they're not consciously aware of it. So I think that uh, it's really important to be attentive to the needs of your kids and appreciate that they may be harboring and absorbing some of the tension that you as a first responder or that you as a healthcare provider are bringing home without even realizing it. Yeah, absolutely. And so again, just having that talk with your child and just saying, I'm noticing, you know, maybe myself, I'm bringing something home and can we talk about it? Because yeah. it really can affect our children in different ways. Talking is important and frequently men don't want to talk or don't feel like they need to talk. But the truth is, is that beyond oneself is a system of people that, that we're yep. living with. I also imagine that, that some of the children that live on the Cape have lost their grandparents that are in some of the nursing home facilities, which is, of course, a devastating issue that yeah. people weren't uh, prepared for as well. Yeah, and I, I think that we're going to be seeing a larger number of children and families altogether losing their older loved ones. Um, and we're going to have to figure out a way to support all of us yeah. uh, and each yeah. other 
Yes, absolutely. Oh, and yeah. it's early May right now, and it's possible mm -hmm. that some people will see this webinar in the next week or two, but oh, no. some others may not even see it until the fall, and none of us really know what's going to happen in the fall, let alone summer. We're still kind of figuring out how is Cape mm -hmm. Cod going to handle summer. So uh, any tips for self-care in the fall or at a later point in time? Yeah, and I'm just thinking throughout the summer and into the fall, so really just focusing on how can I still feel like myself. So if you have any outdoor hobbies you enjoy, um, if you have any exercises that you can still do at home, um, make sure you're doing them, taking the time to let yourself enjoy these times and moments with our loved ones, our coworkers, yeah. if you're still at work, it's just so important. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. I don't have other thank questions you, unless you have anything else to add. I don't. Just everyone stay healthy, stay safe, and thank you for all that you do. Absolutely. And thank you, Justine, for being here. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Welcome, Dan Gates, from the AIDS Support Group of Cape Cod, where you are the CEO. Thank you for doing this. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I was hoping that you could talk about the issue of substance abuse versus misuse, mm -hmm. harm reduction. And I'm asking you this based on the fact that there are a lot of first responders and healthcare providers that have been working so hard and they're probably wrung out and traumatized. And of course, it's so easy at the end of a day or at the end of a week or at the end of a long period of time to turn to the bottle or turn to pills for use as a way of coping, uh, when in fact that isn't always the healthiest way. Indeed, yeah, I think the, the self-care component of this is really challenging, especially over long-term exposure to trauma, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of the people who are doing the frontline work are either experiencing vicarious trauma Mm -hmm. or their own trauma in the work they're doing or in the work we're doing. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. So thinking about kind of the harm reduction model of work yeah. we do, right? So yeah. is, is, uh, the idea of harm reduction is, you, you know, you meet people where they are and you find out kind of what is working for them, what isn't working for them, is there anything they want to change, right? Yeah. So there, for some people, there can be a healthy balance of some like uh, a glass of wine at the end of the day wouldn't be a challenge for them right but uh, during times of crisis yeah. that can shift right yes. so it can take yes. even people who didn't previously have an overly addictive relationship with things they're suddenly noticing huh that glass of wine is now two glasses of wine or that glass is getting very large and there are yeah. two of them right yeah. so i think a lot of it is really trying to structure days around what are some activities I need to do yes. that I'm checking in with my self-care, right? So whether yes. that's just taking a pause yes. and breathing, yeah. or uh, I think for a lot of us, it's finding a way to get outside, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, we, that, and that's, that's, you know, we're so lucky that we live here on Cape Cod and those of us that are a little too busy sometimes forget to go outside and to take in the beauty of where we live and work. And I know you and I have had some of these conversations ourselves. Yeah. Every single person that I've interviewed has talked about going outside, which is an incredible thing. Um, right. We all have to remember that. Would it be okay for me to comment on some of, the, some of what you mentioned about um, harm reduction? Absolutely. Which is that as a psychotherapist, you know, I've been taught that when people are struggling with alcohol or drugs that they need to stop and go into AA and, and that's it. And over the years, what I've appreciated is that there's a handful of people that aren't necessarily interested in doing that. So a harm reduction model is an alternative that really makes sense. And I like what you mentioned about taking stock, taking inventory. Where, how am I inching up? What's dangerous about the way that I'm using or drinking these days and how can I moderate it and be honest with myself about that so right you. I totally agree because I think also one of the things that's been so helpful for me in this work is 
before I got into this work, I worked in a different field and it was a very different world for me. And when I heard recovery, yeah. I heard 100% abstinence. Yeah. I thought recovery meant 12 step uh, uh, attendance and absolute abstinence. And what I've learned is through harm reduction, there can be that spectrum of what your recovery looks yeah. like. Yeah. And so for some it is abstinence, but for others it's a, okay, what, what am I doing to, all the things you just outlined, to make okay. sure I'm checking in with myself and doing the self-care? I think it's a hard thing for people to do on their own. Um, so what I would suggest is that people get some support from others, whether it be a mental health professional, someone in the substance abuse field, or even a colleague who's been struggling themselves. Absolutely. And I think there's an opportunity in the Zoom world we're having right now yes. of I think accessing support in ways that for some I think it even feels safer like I would never want to I could see people saying I wouldn't want to self-identify as walking into a group asking for help with something right but there are all of these groups popping up online right now yes. that you can kind of dip in and out of right yeah. and find Easy. um yeah yeah and it's kind of the old classic model of peer support find other people who are doing the similar work you're doing or having the similar stress and then talking. I think that a lot of people who live here on the Cape are very concerned about confidentiality and being seen and being discovered going to a 12 step meeting. So this is a nice alternative. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I also wanted to say, Rick, there was one thing about the outdoors yeah. part too is, so yesterday I did a, um, a breakfast outside mm -hmm. with a group of people where we yeah. all sat, we were out by a yeah. beach I love and it. we were all at tables Wonderful. more than six feet apart, right? Mm -hmm. And then we went on a walk. Yeah. I have to say in the morning when I had the opportunity to do it, I had to make myself do it. That's yeah. what was interesting. Yes. I had all kinds of work pressures that I felt like I needed to do. And yeah. I was mapping out my day and I thought, this is really going to compact my day by doing this. Thank and you. made myself do it. And it was the best thing. I came back a different person. And this, the work was still there. You know, I had to jump back into it. But I was able to recharge in some way, both from a social um, outlet and the outdoors and fresh air. So That's such a good point for yeah. bringing this up. And, you know, we're at a point where socializing with distance is really important. And everyone has been with their nose to the ground, literally saving lives and doing things for the community. And now, hopefully things will lessen a little bit and the weather is getting nicer and it's time for us to take care of ourselves. And interesting, I think this may have been a part of what you were alluding to yesterday. We've gotten in a rut of not being available, working overtime right. and getting everything done and not even bothering to socialize. And as we enter the world of regular living, we're gonna have to push ourselves like you were describing to kind of get used to seeing people again. Absolutely, and then also, I think the, the stimulation of being around people, you also have to give yourself maybe a little bit of time after that too, like we are re-acclimating. It's like a, a kid going to school for the first time yes. and learning how to be around people. We have to re, we're gonna have to re-socialize, depending, right. I mean, depending right. on what your, your um, social distancing protocols have looked like, but. Well, um, if, you're, if you're a true introvert, this is, in heaven, but I think it's going to be hard for people to step back into reality. And I assume that some men may have been more private during the last couple months. And as we move forward with COVID-19, especially for those that have been working hard and have been traumatized, people are going to pull in more and maybe drink more as well. Absolutely. And I think there's also that added component of it's kind of like people who are doing military work. Yeah. People who have been doing this frontline work right now have been in a different orbit than a lot of their friends and colleagues, right? Yeah. And so yeah. how do you, as, as your friends start to be back out in the world again, mm -hmm. how do you check in with people? And, and God, the phrase that came to mind is sometimes, you know, you're not okay. So how do yeah. you say that? Like, I'm that's a little right. not okay right now and I need A, B, or C to take care of myself. And that's why I'm doing this, so that people can watch and get a sense that it, it really is okay not to be okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's great that you're doing this. this is Thank really cool. you. So um, in our last few moments, tell us, for those that don't know you, about what you do at the support group and also some of the other work that you're doing on the Cape. 
Sure. Um, so I've worked at the support group for many years now, about eight years. I am now the CEO, uh, which is fantastic. So during um, COVID-19, it's been really an interesting time to be in that position because we've really worked hard to maintain all of our services mm -hmm. while doing socially distant protocols and wow. keeping everyone safe. And I, I, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this too. Part of what's hard is how do you do no harm in the work you're doing, right? Yeah. So you have to take care of your staff, your clients, all of that. So yeah. that's, yeah, so that's been a really unique challenge, but luckily um, I have a behavior health background and that has been very helpful both for myself and working with yeah. teams during this. Yeah. And then, um, and then, you know, in town, we're working with groups and mm -hmm. lots of, lots of planning and trying to just make sure that we're at the table and helping everyone imagine what summer and beyond looks like. And you are on a task force as well. Maybe that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So, um, I'm co-chairing the social services domain of the Provincetown recovery coalition, which wow. is. Yeah, it's really nice. It was put together by Robin Craver, who's the town manager of Provincetown. And it was mm -hmm. really kind of forward thinking. She put it together weeks ago. Yeah. And, and we're developing a plan of how to kind of advise her, give her as much information. We did a massive survey, by the way, that I should mention. Yeah. That was the most utilized surveys that's ever been done Wonderful. under this the Cape. So, so that really gave people a voice to say, this is how I'm doing, this is what we're yeah. concerned about, et cetera. Yeah and it helps her make a decision. Great. Well, any other last words of advice before we part? Only that I wanted to say very quickly, so astronaut Scott Kelly mm -hmm. wrote a piece in the New York Times that yes. people should look up if yep. they want to. It's called, I spent a year in space and I have tips on isolation to share. <laughs> and it's really interesting the things he says. Follow a schedule, pace yourself, go outside. Yeah. Um, you need a hobby, <laughs> mm -hmm. keep a journal, yep. and take time to connect. Perfect. So, yeah, that's my little checklist for the I love it. They're great. I hope you're doing it yourself. Um, and um, as sure. you're reading them, I'm like, phew, I think I passed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> thank you for your wisdom, and thank you for your amazing work on Cape Cod. And, love uh, you as well, Rick. Thank you. It. Take care. Bye-bye. Now moving on to self-care, which is what this whole series is about. I'm going to give you my own list of things that I've jotted down, but also keep in mind that each speaker has given you their own ideas as well. And what I like about their ideas and their feedback is that there's a lot of overlap between what people say, which is a sign of what works. So I'm going to just give my own ideas. It may be a recap at this point, but that's okay. Uh, first thing, of course, to do is mindfulness. Now, what is mindfulness anyways? It's a very cliche term these days. Diane Kovand, of course, will speak about it, but mindfulness is just being rooted in the present. And the reason why mindfulness is important is because frequently during difficult times, what we do is we get caught in living through what just happened in the past and then sometimes make it even further back. We go back further in our own lives and we're living our own hell that took place, whether it be a day ago or a month ago or even a decade ago. And then when things were so bad, we jump forward into the future, imagining that things are going to be horrible and they're never going to get any better, which is a sign of anxious thinking. Mindfulness is being in the present and rooting yourself in that experience. So what works beautifully, of course, is closing your eyes, taking a few easy breaths, listening to the sounds around you in this moment. I'm also going to show you some quick mindfulness exercises, um, settling in, using your body awareness in the moment to be aware. The other thing uh, that's important in self-care is acceptance. You can't undo where we are. And you can't fight with the reality of COVID-19. And the truth is, at the end of each of our days, we're exhausted, we're anxious, we're worried, we're scared, we're angry. But we kind of have to accept that. And is it defeat? Or is it healthy to accept that? I actually think on some level, it's healthy. 
The other most important thing about self-care that I keep stressing over and over again is support. You can't hold this all on your own. It's just, it's too much. Reach out for help, whether it be friends, whether it be co-workers, whether it be family, whether it be a therapist. Please don't shoulder everything all by yourself. I also believe that work is a really important source of support. And personally, I think that workplaces, especially where you've been doing frontline work, should provide support for their employees. I just led a four-week group at Aid Support Group of Cape Cod, a mindfulness group for staff member dealing with stress during the time of COVID. It was immensely helpful. We left the door open saying, if they need more, I will gladly do it. I'm hoping that your workplace provides services for you, especially in the comfort of your coworkers who've been through much of the same thing, no explanations needed. You've witnessed, you've experienced certain things together, and it's so reassuring to do that. Um, I am a big lover of laughter. Do whatever you can do to find humor in your lives, whether it be calling the people that will make you laugh, seeing funny movies. I've been watching a series of horrible, trashy movies that are so funny, and it takes me out of the state of worry that I've been in, and it just lightens everything. As I said, support, camaraderie, grieving together. Find the people that are grieving like you are and be in touch with them. Dan Gates mentioned journaling. I think it's a great way to keep track of things, whether it be a release for yourself or something that you may want to look back to, back at at a particular point in time or share. Um, just keep track of what you're feeling. You can do it in an actual journal. You can do it online. You can do it in your computer, your phone, whatever. Um, I'm also a big believer in archiving things. I love photo albums. I love scrapbooks. I love family history. So I actually wonder if it might make sense for you to keep track of some of these experiences for your children or for subsequent generations. You don't know who's going to be interested or who's even going to care about what you're experiencing, but there will be people who will want to know this and your evidence and your memories that are recorded will be just that for people. So do that. Um, I also think a creative outlet is so helpful to people. We live on Cape Cod for a reason, and part of the reason that we live here not only is for the beauty, but creativity flourishes here. There are many, many artistic people. Find hobbies, do things that you enjoy. Creativity isn't only art. It can happen through exercise, through music, through cooking, through any of the things that you do that are soulful and helpful to you. And then lastly, keep in shape, go out for walks. I don't know if you're able to go to a gym or if you have a gym at home, please exercise, release what you're holding in your body through physical activities. Diane Kovanda and I will be speaking about yoga um, and the release of stress physically. And lastly is the issue of therapy. Are you willing to go to therapy? Do you need therapy? Can you allow yourself to reach out for help? It's a very difficult thing to do. I know I sound like a broken record, but you don't have to sit with this alone. Please get some help. If people are telling you that you need help, listen to them. If no one is telling you that you need help, but you're feeling like you do, go for it. Contact me, contact the resources based on the people I've interviewed here, find local mental health people. There's a lot of amazing providers on Cape Cod. Therapy is amazing because it's a place to go to face truth. It's a place to share with other people who you don't want to burden. Going to a therapist means you can be brutally honest and you don't have to worry about how they're going to take care of themselves. Therapy is also helpful because it can help people find resiliency in the midst of sadness. And that is crucial right now. We all have a strong part of ourselves and we need to tap into our resiliency. And sometimes the place that we can do that best is in therapy. 
Therapy also helps you allow pain to be part of what you experience. And I think that's really important. Sometimes we're so busy pushing pain away that that actually creates more symptoms, more physical symptoms or emotional symptoms. Um, healthy compartmentalization is exactly what it sounds like. You want to have places to put things where it's good to push things aside so it's not overwhelming you and therapy can help with that. And um, many people say that therapy has changed their lives. And I don't know if that would be the case for you. I hope so. But if you need it, allow yourself to pursue it. Therapy can help you find strength and hope. It's that simple. So be honest with yourself. Do you need this? Will it help? Don't be too proud. Let it happen. Thanks. So welcome, Diane Covanda. We're thrilled to have you here. Thanks, Rick. Uh, can you Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about what you do, and then I'll ask. I'll explain why I asked you to do this. Sure. So uh, I do two things, but they're very related. One is uh, I've had a stress stress management center for over twenty five years, and <laughs> work with people with stress resilience on. Um, every angle of life where people experience anxiety and stress. And then I also own a yoga school. So I teach teachers how to teach yoga and meditation and mindfulness. So they're very related. Totally. Uh, but the stress management is for everyone. They never even have to think of yoga. Well, you are an incredible person. And I can say that firsthand. I respect you immensely. And I thought it would be great to interview you based on these interests that you have. And I've been thinking a lot these days about COVID-19 and the way in which people hold stress in their bodies and what it may mean to their overall well-being or lack of well-being, as it were. So I was wondering if you, you could address that. Sure. And that's a, that's a great topic, Rick, because... I think whether anyone thinks they're stressed or not, it does get very subtle for some people that think they're not stressed and it's, it's oriented in their bodies. And I'll just tell a few, I'll super simplify because we, right. I know we're limited on time. Uh, just a few things that folks might relate to. Um, number one, shoulders, mm -hmm. they rise and rise and rise and they, and they end up living up there where it looks almost normal but yeah, they really, really belong down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, jaws get yeah. very tense. Yeah. And these are all protective mechanisms. So as I say them, I'll, I'll just say the shoulders are up. They're ready to protect, protect the body. The, the large muscles are ready to fight or flight. Um, the jaw closes so you don't drown or so that you can bite someone to protect yourself. Wow. Uh, it, it's muscle tension right in here in in the TMJ area and um, your running muscles, your lower back muscles, your glutes, they're all ready for action. And the thing that we're dealing with uh, all over the planet is not something we can run from. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a stress response that's that's not useful. It's actually taking energy out of our immune system, yes. which is what we really need to be online. Um, so these physical reactions, whether it's to freeze, shut down, or uh, to run or fight, uh, aren't useful, but yet we still have them. And yeah. so people really somatize it, and, and it's all in the body, and everybody's on edge. Yeah. I, yeah. I've seen everybody that, uh, the calmest people, they're, they're just this close to the edge of uh, freaking out a little bit. Well, I think every single person I've spoken to has had their moments of freak out, and they've either taken it out on their family members or they've taken it out on an email with some, with someone including strangers or they've taken it out with people that aren't wearing masks in public so we all have our moments um i was wondering if you could address how people can take care of themselves in some basic ways to be good to their bodies and obviously their minds as well their souls sure uh and I, I think it's a 
revisiting it, recalculating all day long. Uh, and we, we need to be vigilant about recalculating to a place of centeredness and groundedness and taking a deep breath many times during the day. Breathing when it's done consciously goes, takes your system from that fight or flight or freeze to the rest and digest and restore mode. And that's, that's what you want to wake up in you. Uh, rest, digest, and, uh, and, and, ooh, restore. Thank you. Um, I just worry uh, in that way of everybody's in that on and watching the news and uh, listening and reading, and it keeps us really on. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can back off from that a whole bunch of times during the day, and just take a few deep breaths and say, okay, right, right this minute, my feet are on the ground or I'm looking right. outside or, or breathing fresh air and I can actually breathe. So instead of the worry about what could happen to my lungs, it's take a deep breath. And I like looking at it as a trigger. So if, if you find yourself shut down a little bit, let that be the trigger of, oh, take a deep breath now. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let that lead to the next place instead of spiraling into yes. the tension. Yeah, so good. This is so useful. Thank you. I'm also finding it very affirming because yesterday I recorded five mini relaxations for people to oh, practice. Good. One of them was about tightening the shoulders and then letting them go. And of course, the others were breathing ones. So apparently I was on the money. Who knew? <laughs> you are right on it. I can't wait to hear them. Thank you. Well, you and I have done some of this work together, so you've yes. been inspirational to me. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, being a healthcare provider and being a first responder and going through the same thing simultaneously? I mean, frequently in our work, there's distance between what we're doing and the people that we're working with and our own private lives. And then suddenly we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. uh, for healthcare providers and the first responders, I think the number one thing, and you all know it, uh, but you are a different kind of human that is for others, uh, that, that is so deeply caring and thinking about a bigger picture that you don't always include yourselves in that taking care of place. And uh, I have talked to amazing first responders that are just on for everybody else, everybody else. And uh, they're putting their uh, input where they can to take care of other people. And they're going home exhausted and they're working these super long hours and there is no time to replenish and uh, if it could somehow uh, be on a note on your screen or if you're driving an ambulance uh, right there above the steering wheel, a little sticky note that says breathe or recalculating. I love that word because I mm, think of my word. GPS. Yeah. She's got the greatest voice. And whenever I'm off course, she goes, recalculating. <laughs> I love <laughs> and, it. Uh, you know, if, if you can put recalculating and then help yourself before wow. you're on for everybody else yeah. and that is the take your shoulders up and drop them take a deep breath when you take your shoulders up it takes half a second really yeah. and uh, yeah. just recalculate throughout the whole day and then really take care of yourself when you get home great what about yoga poses are there some basic ones that you would recommend yes and I think most people like this one. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you know anything about yoga or not, it's called the final relaxation pose. Uh, my dog is just leaving that. <laughs> he had enough. <laughs> he's he been it. demonstrating it the whole time, and he's like, "You haven't, you haven't focused on me." So, <laughs> <laughs> but it is belly up like a dog. <laughs> really? And yeah, it's just really the uh, belly up position for for humans. And just uh, take your hands away from, from your body and, and let your feet flop out mm -hmm. and just relax for a few moments. And that is actually a yoga pose. Wow. And uh, nice. the other one is um, 
getting your spine to flex in every possible way. And so again, you don't need to know yoga, but um, you can think about it. How many different ways can my spine go? Because all the muscles along the spine and the shoulders are so tense. So if you can go forward, arch back, side, mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. and a twist each way, mm -hmm. and you can do it in your chair or even in the, um, you know, when you're in a parking lot in a car, uh, you don't have to have a special yoga mat or yoga clothes, but just think how many ways can my spine move and stretch things out because then you make more room for your lungs to breathe. We get compact and tight, 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 and our lungs have very little space to expand on the inhale. So if you can think about take a deep breath this way, take a deep breath that way. It's super simple, but it's also it really instinctual. Works. You know, mm -hmm. when you're describing this, I'm thinking that people have a fear of yoga because they're not enlightened enough. And what you're describing is something that we all need and that we all can do instinctually. It is. It's so basic. Yeah. And when we're tense, we don't think of that common sense yeah. stuff where yes. we're just in a different frame of mind that's yeah. very linear and get from A to B and that's it. And mm -hmm. uh, we don't get into that creative space of what can I do for myself. Right. I also think the other thing that may happen is that people will experience the wear and tear of this months down the road mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, it's not just what we're feeling today and it isn't just a month from now. It may hit people uh, way down the road. Yes. And there's a thing that is in the therapy world. It's, it's a title called compassion fatigue. Yes. And it's for, uh, people that care that get fatigued from hearing what's going on with people and uh, it's usually for the the caregivers they get compassion fatigue but I think this is a whole new fatigue of yeah. hearing about this and having your system rev even if you're sitting on the couch yeah. looking at the news you're going to get an intense form of fatigue over time yeah, uh, yeah, because it's nonstop and it's not going anywhere. The outer circumstances are not going to change. That's right. So we've got to be able to uh, really take care of ourselves in in a whole new kind of way and be more vigilant about it. Mm -hmm. And that that will stave off some of that fatigue. And when you feel it, um, I'm going to call it COVID fatigue. Uh, when you feel your whole system worn down or overwhelmed or all you want to do is sleep, then just try to get some more sleep, yeah. try to rest and read a good book that's funny mm -hmm. or, um, you know, humor is so powerful because when, when true stress and anxiety is happening, you don't find anything funny, right? If you're in fight or flight, nothing is funny. But if you can find a way to laugh during the day, um, I've, I've uh, told my family members, see if you can remember the funnies so we can share them. Great. Um, mm -hmm. Then it does, again, get you more into the restore mode instead of yep. the stress mode. Where can people contact you? Um, my website is probably the easiest way to contact me. It's kindyoga.com and my number's on there, and Great. you can make uh, appointments for stress resilience sessions. I do them over Zoom or FaceTime or phone. I'm and, hoping uh, that maybe you can do a group for healthcare providers and first responders, or you and I, I can love it. together. Yeah, contact me and I will pull it together. Wonderful. Other final comments? I think it's so important to keep coming back to the breath and keep getting your mind out of the um, the excitable stress response yes, uh, yes. constantly being stimulated so breathe and re recalculate your mind so that you're in a in a better space nobody's dealing well with this mm -hmm. so don't even put those standards on yourself that's really important. No one is dealing well with this. And no. 
you know, everyone, I'm not, you're not right. <laughs> exactly. I'm not, you're not. And we're, we're no okay doesn't. for, for, for a while. And then you just feel like, Oh, everything's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, and then you come back and be okay again. So yeah. don't, don't get hard on any, any, anybody on yourself. Good, good. And there's no predictability. You know, it's like, it's at any random moment or time or time of day where, you know, something can trigger you. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much for doing this. Rick. Yeah, I wish we had more time. Uh, great to see you. And uh, everyone, please take care of yourselves. And I think you're giving us great tools, Diane. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Take care. You too. I wanted to give you a few quick relaxation exercises that you can do on your own. Even though I'm going to be giving you more mindfulness exercises a little bit later, I just wanted to give you a few brief ones. And the reason why is we get bogged down by stress. We go through our days. We hold the tension, the irritability inside of our body without even decompressing. I have spent so many hours speaking to clients the last couple weeks about the ways in which they're holding stress inside their body, which is why I'm glad we have Diane Covanda to speak with. But aside from that, you can check in with yourself throughout the day and give yourself small breaks. So I'm gonna give you four different ways. The first way, way number one, is simply to count from one to three, and then back to one with a slow breath. So I'll do it. One, two, three, two, and one. I didn't time that, but maybe that was 20 seconds. And when you do this, if you practice this, you're going to feel like a different person when you bring yourself back. It's easy. It's fun. Do it. You'll feel the benefits. Number two is a version of number one, except all you do is close your eyes. Notice the tightness and the tension in your body. And then breathe it away. Simple. We do this all the time, but so often we forget to take just a moment and we're busy at work, busy in intense negotiations with people, in irritable moments. And you can take a moment and do this. Go in, notice tension, breathe it out. This next one, number three, is a variation on this which is to take in a breath, exaggerate tension, and then let it out. So I'm gonna do it with you. So take a breath in, exaggerate tension, every fiber of your being, hold it for a few moments, and then let it out. Take a breath in, tighten, tense, exaggerate, let it out. If you do this, three times, you are going to notice the experience of calm. You're going to feel like a different person. And the last one is simply to close your eyes, to notice a place in nature, a place of serenity, a favorite place of yours, loosening tightness, softening your body, and coming back that simple. So let me repeat them for you one more time. First one, breathe slowly and deeply, counting from three, one, two, three, back down to one. Second one, closing your eyes, noticing tightness and tension, and exhaling it away. Third one, breathing in, exaggerating tightness and tension, breathing it out and letting go. And then the fourth one is simply closing your eyes and visualizing a peaceful place in nature. You can do these in staggered ways, break them up, 
do it once, twice, three times a day, you're going to feel like a different person. Take a few moments and get in a very comfortable position. Perhaps you'd like to sit down on your favorite chair, or maybe you'd even like to lie down. Whatever is the most comfortable for you. Simply allow your body to get into a position that feels just right. And take a few easy breaths. In and out. Breathing in and out. Taking a breath in and letting go. Excellent. And appreciate for now that the only thing you need to do is this. Find a space for relaxation. Enjoy these few moments. A time to be still. A time to put everything else in a different space. Because right now, all you need is quiet and peace and the gift of presence. And as you are doing this, you may notice that your body begins to feel a little heavy in a really nice way. Perhaps your arms and your fingers feel soft. Same with your legs. Your belly and chest are soft. And just notice the way in which your body melds in to the space that you are sitting in or lying in. And that is exactly what you need for now. Just the experience of quiet. For a few moments, Notice your entire body. Where are you holding tightness and tension? I wonder if you can allow yourself to let go, breathing away tightness. Some people feel it most in their forehead, in their neck and their shoulders or in their cheeks. Allow your whole head to be loose. Swish your tongue around between your teeth, which allows your cheeks to loosen. Drop your shoulders down to let go of any tension that you may be holding there. And moment by moment, you find yourself going further and deeper into the space of comfort. Excellent. Even if your mind is drifting, Your body is still relaxed. So you are taking this time and achieving a benefit for doing this. Acknowledge to yourself that you know that this is good for you, that this is very important for your own well-being And maybe you've waited a little too long to do this. 
So here you are now, and this is good. And it really makes a difference to create a space like this for yourself. Because in the last several weeks, you probably haven't had enough of this. And now in this moment, you do. And that is good. Appreciate that in this moment, what you experience is a great awareness, otherwise known as mindfulness. And the awareness that you experience is what your body feels right now. Or the sounds that you hear in the space that you are in right now or being aware of the sound of my voice as I speak to you and how you respond. Great. This is just what you need. I don't know if you've been craving this or if you simply are enjoying it in this moment. Whichever it is, this is a moment of mindfulness, of pure comfort and peace. Excellent. And as you are in this space, and you are able to acknowledge the feelings of peace, allow it to come over you and spread out throughout your entire body. That's right. And as you recognize the feelings of peace in this moment, allow yourself to trust that not only are they yours for now, They are also yours for later. The feeling stays with you. The memory of doing this will stay with you. The good that comes out of this will always be remembered. Think about sometimes during rain and wind and stormy weather, how unsettling it feels. Sometimes it's just so difficult to find peace and comfort. It is as if it will never stop. But then, something happens. The clouds blow away. The sun shines through. And little by little, there are no more clouds in the sky. Everything is bright. The ground dries out. And suddenly it feels like a whole new world. It's such a relief to experience this clearing. And you can appreciate now that what you are doing is just the same, creating a clearing for yourself, allowing the sun to shine over you and finding peace. And you can appreciate that this peace and comfort that is yours now, again, will be with you later. You don't need to tense up to worry about remembering this, it's yours. It lives inside of you. It makes a difference and you get it. Moments like this are lasting and comfortable. Inside of you now is the awareness 
that pain is going further and further back so that comfort and well-being is yours for now and also for later. Great. Throughout your life, there have been many struggles like any other person. It's not just you, it's all of us. Think of a hard phase of time that you've had in your life before. Allow it to just trickle into your awareness. Remember when it was, how old you were at the time, what you looked like back then, where you lived, what life looked like around you and felt like inside of you. And appreciate that back then it felt like it would never end. But somehow you got through it. That's right. Maybe it happened easily and without trying or maybe you had to work hard to get beyond this difficult time and reach a new place, a plateau of comfort and well-being. And as you are here in this comfortable place in this moment, you can use the experience from this previous moment to simply reassure you that if you did it then, you will do it again and it will happen now. You will find your way to comfort and peace and your life will continue to steadily get better and improve. That's right. Or imagine a family member, an older person, a wise person in your family that has also experienced struggles. Maybe they are alive or maybe they've passed away but allow their essence to join you in this moment. Picture them looking at you, touching you, speaking to you. How is it that they were able to get through hardships? What did they teach you about life, either back then? Or what are you realizing about life through their vantage point right now? Channel them. Allow them to be your guide, as if they are holding your hand and gently guiding you away from stress, away from pain, towards ease, closer and closer to comfort. If they did it, you can do it. If you've done it before, you will do it again. Great. Maybe it was a look in their eyes that spoke to you. Maybe their love seeped in 
and helped you. Or maybe they help you now. Feel grateful for their help. They are here for you. Welcome them to be your role model and your guide. That's right. Many of you have done it long before I've suggested it in this moment. For some, this may be the first time. That's great. As you think about what you have experienced in the last several weeks during COVID-19, of course there has been stress, undoubtedly many struggles. Maybe it's gotten in the way of your own well-being or your family's well-being. But despite that, There have been moments of joy, moments where you wouldn't have done it any other way. Focus on this right now. Joy comes in many forms. It may have been the look on someone's face when you assisted them and gave them comfort. Or it may have been the gratitude of a family member of a patient who felt lost, but your commitment helped them. Or it may be the feeling of returning home at the end of a long shift, exhausted, and how comfortable it was to be home once again. Of course, there are many moments of joy in the midst of pain. Your challenge is to accept this. And you can, and you do. Someday, you will look back at this time and appreciate this with a perspective that is so different from now. That's just the way life is, and that is exactly what happens with time. You don't have to worry about how you will do that, or what sense you will make of this. Just trust that that will happen. Picture yourself at a future point in time, looking back. Imagine that you're looking at a scrapbook or looking at images on your computer back to this time where you were what you were doing to help out others what it meant to others, to community members to yourself thank yourself for being of service and being strong and being able to help others when they needed it most. And even if you felt stress, even if it was a challenge, you did it. And the perspective that you experience in this future moment will be so very reassuring. Later, when you look back, you won't feel the heaviness that you feel now. Instead, you will feel pride and joy for all that you did. Trust that this will be the case. Even if you don't feel that now, trust that in the future, You will beam, you will feel proud, 
you will share these experiences with your children, with your family, with your friends. And people will so appreciate what you did to help them, to help your fellow humans, friends, and neighbors. That's right. You are loved and respected in your community based on all of the sacrifices that you have made And even if you wouldn't have done it any other way, it sure feels good to be recognized and noticed. To know that community and people who love you appreciate everything that you have done for them, for all of us. We thank you for that. We really thank you. Notice what you are feeling inside of yourself right now. Over this period of time, your body has acclimated to comfort. You feel as if you have been on a long, deep journey into well-being. And the comfort that you feel in your body will be what you experience more and more and more. Listen to the sounds of where you are, most likely in your own safe, comfortable place, your room, your home, your car, outdoors, how familiar these sounds and these experiences are. The feelings of well-being remain strong and will continue to remain strong. That's right. Appreciate that in your own life, progress will continue to take place to take space, to take even more space as you move forward. And as you go into your future, the pain and stress of this moment will gently dissipate. And even if the memories in this feel fresh and strong right now, They fade, they really fade, just as you have experienced in this moment. Little by little, comfort and joy is what you have. And you know that this is important and this is good. So take a few more easy, deep breaths and prepare to bring yourself back. Very gently and slowly. Wiggle your toes. Wiggle your fingers just for a bit. Imagine what it will look like when you open your eyes move your entire body just a bit your neck and shoulders you can tilt them as well orienting yourself into your body even before you open your eyes in a few moments when i count from three to one you will open your eyes at one but before doing so trust that what you have received from this experience will continue to nourish you through time. That's right, nourished with time 
and through time. So that when I count from three to one and you open your eyes at one, you will feel refreshed, strong, ready to feel better. Three, opening your eyes slowly, two, and one. Present, alert, feeling good, welcome back. breath. Your belly is rising and falling, rising and falling, and you focus on deep, comfortable breathing. Soften your face and your forehead. Soften the place above your eyes, the back of your head, your cheeks, and your jaws. That's right. Soften your neck and your shoulders. As you breathe deeply, the thought from today drift further and further away. You may notice the sound of my voice as I speak to you, or continue to notice the in and out movement of your belly, or you may go to your own place further and further away. Each time you come back and notice your thoughts, or if you become aware of tension, just picture them drifting away gently and slowly, slowly and gently. Like driving in a car and looking in the rear view mirror, what once was the present becomes the past. And the further and further away that you are, you no longer see what was in sight. As you move further forward, memories and feelings drift away. Good. And as you drift away, You might even notice that my words aren't significant to you because you bring yourself to the right place inside, just the right place inside. Allow your mind to continue drifting and enjoy that peaceful, quiet place in your body. As you're lying still, experience the quietness of this moment in a peaceful way. You drift in and drift out. Your awareness comes and goes. And without any worries, you let yourself continue to visit that deep place inside. You might even picture a child that you know, a friend, a friend's child, or even a family member, a young child who's happy and carefree. And just look at him or her and appreciate what you feel inside. If you don't come up with a particular child, you can even imagine you being the perfect parent 
to a child. And as you watch this child, it feels really good inside to be happy. And at the end of a wonderful day, it's bedtime. And he or she gets ready for bed. Just notice what this child is wearing, the colorful pattern on the pajamas or the nightgown, the material that the pajamas are made of, whether there are buttons or snaps or zippers, or some children's pajamas have those plastic feet on the bottom. And you appreciate that this child doesn't have a care in the world at nighttime. And the child asks for a story. And you may read a story or someone else reads a story to this child as the day winds down peacefully. In this moment, everything feels okay. And before drifting off, the child gets a kiss goodnight and enjoys a peaceful, quiet feeling. Sometimes in summertime, the light is still out at bedtime. And as the light of nighttime shifts and changes, the peaceful sounds of nature at nighttime are so soothing. Like crickets in the background, or a breeze coming in the windows, or a nice humid smell from outdoors on a peaceful night. Sometimes you can watch a child sleep or even watch your own pet sleeping. And they have this carefree innocence as they're resting. Their bellies just rise and fall as they're in their nice peaceful world. It gives you such a warm feeling inside. Appreciating this feeling. You might even remember a favorite place of yours. A place where you used to live or visit. Or a comfortable space in your home. A place on vacation that's been so calm and relaxing. One place is like being at the beach, lying down on your towel feeling the firmness of the sand beneath you, lying on your back, closing your eyes, and feeling the warmth of the sun shining down on your skin, hearing the sounds of the waves hitting the shore, a soothing sensation in your body, and the activities and conversations that you hear around you simply fade away in the background as you go to a deeper and quieter place inside. And even if you want to stay awake and be attentive, you find yourself drifting off in and out. You might drift back in for a moment and be alert, and then a moment later you drift back out, effortlessly, just letting it all go, back and forth. Your mind 
can be like a dimmer switch where you notice that your thoughts become intense and you slowly turn them down. And as you let go, you remain calm inside and let things melt away effortlessly. Focus on peaceful feelings. Appreciate this moment of lying still. Being nice and quiet. And your mind drifts further and further away. Sometimes, as a passenger in the car, you can't help but get sleepy. The sounds of the car and the motion lulls you to that sleepy place. You might even hear a song playing on the radio and it sounds like it plays forever and ever as you drift in and drift out. Your head may bob as you drift. The background noises come and go. Just allow yourself to enjoy the experience, knowing that it's perfectly fine to come and to go. You lose track of time. You already experience a restful moment. And as you drift off to a real comfortable place, you feel so good. You can appreciate how soft your clothes feel, or the feeling of the sheets on your skin, with your head resting on a pillow, your entire body feeling heavy as you let go of the tensions of the day. You might even decide to put distressing moments of the day into a box. Notice what the box looks like. And as you put the thoughts inside, close the box gently. That's right. And imagine putting the box in another space, in another room, out of your sight for now, out of your awareness. It will be waiting for you in the future, when you need it or want it. And for now, you can just let go, let things be further and further away, and just enjoy the richness of this moment. As you continue to drift in and out, each time you come back to awareness, you experience a sense of calmness, and you remind yourself that it feels good to drift further and further away, and just enjoy how good you feel. In this moment, all of this that you do is doable and easy. And you can let yourself continue to let go and let be. Drifting away, feeling comfortable, feeling just right. Because it really is a good night. So here we are. We've reached the end of the webinar. Thank you so much for joining me and being attentive to yourself and to what I have to offer. Thank you to all the amazing speakers for donating their time and sharing their ideas with us. And again, thank you, every single one of you, for the work that you're doing. As I've said many times, you may be feeling fine now. You may need this later on. Save the link. Go back, listen to the parts, watch the parts as many times as you need. Please share this with other people. The intent of my doing this is to share ways of coping and feeling better during tough times. And please take really good care of yourselves. Take care.